Hi, welcome. Uh, this is a presentation on batch process control strategies. We're going to be examining how manufacturers are using modern process control to maintain batch to batch quality. Hi, I'm Gregory McMillan. I'm a retired senior fellow from the Solution Monsanto and an ISA fellow. I was an adjunct professor at Washington University in St. Louis in the chemical engineering department. I'm currently a consultant contracting through CDI process and industrial and also a part-time employee at Mina Technologies. Uh, I was inducted in the Control Magazine Automation Hall of Fame and got an ISA Life Achievement Award. I'm an author of numerous books and I am also the founder and co-leader with Hunter Vegas of the ISA Mentor Program uh, for users. Uh, you can uh, see my expertise on uh, my post on the websites uh, shown here for uh, both Control Magazine and the ISA organization. The original presentation was at Chemicals and Petrochemicals Plant Automation Congress 2015, uh, but this sequel is uh, sponsored by Emerson, Xperia Tech, and Mina. Hi, I'm known for my comic relief, so we're going to start out right here with uh, the top 10 songs for a batch project. Does anybody really know what batch this is? Another batch bites the dust. We got to get data out of this process if it's the last thing we ever do. Good batches, bad batches, you know I've had my share. Correlation dreaming. Changes in variables, changes in attitudes. There must be 50 ways to model your process. The project's so bright, I gotta wear shades. Give me all your data, all your QA too. In a planta da vida. So here are the topics. Why are batch processes difficult? Applying data analytics to batch endpoints to prevent bad batches to increase both plant capacity and yield for maximum plant profit. Reviewing weights and sequential operations to reduce batch cycle times to increase batch capacity for maximum saleable product. Computing batch profile slopes for control and prediction to enable more repeatable batches and other batch decisions. Quantifying online batch metrics for measuring and improving batch costs and capacity to maximize profit. Evaluating logic for decisions and optimization of yield versus capacity to determine the optimum batch completion time. Assessing batch process dynamics and controller tuning to improve loop performance and reduce batch variability. And then finally, examining the control structures that will maximize production rate and batch repeatability for maximum profitability. So why are batch processes so difficult? Well, you can kind of see this, that it's like a perpetual startup and shutdown. You're filling things up or pressurizing things and then you're maybe depressurizing and of course at the end of the batch you're probably draining. Um, but you, it's like you're perpetually going through a startup and shutdown of what we would uh, do in say a continuous process. Every phase is like a process onto itself. You have different equipment, you have different set points, you have different uh, actions going on, uh, different objectives, uh, it completely different uh, uh, actions and, and measurements and uh, instrumentation uh, can be involved in each and every phase. There's a wide spectrum of uh, product grades and formulations, and this is uh, due to the fact that you can actually accomplish this just by going and saying, oh, okay, we have another batch, we can make something different. Whereas if you have a continuous process, you have to go through this transition and how you do that dynamically and minimize uh, the off-spec uh, product as you try and go from one to another 
uh, continuously in a, a unit operation for continuous processes is difficult. So you often don't have uh, that wide spectrum of product grades and formulations just due to the extreme difficulty. Here every batch can be something different. Uh, we have extensive sequencing and operator involvement because so many different you know, unit operations are, and measurements and valves are coming in and out of service and control loops. Uh, we would like that to be all sequenced automatically, but sometimes uh, it hasn't happened and the operator uh, gets involved to make that uh, uh, work well for each uh, and every phase, which is, like I said, a process unto itself. Uh, the response is non-self-regulating. Um, another way of saying it's, it's, uh, it can be integrating or even runaway. And this is primarily due to the fact that uh, we don't have a discharge flow. Typically, we're talking about a bottoms discharge flow. But in some case, uh, it could be also that we don't have a, a, a vapor or a vent gas discharge flow for certain types of uh, batch unit operations. The, the result is uh, that we have a um, non-stationary behavior with no conventional steady state like you have with continuous processes. And like I say, there is this integrating behavior, or even worse than that is a, a runaway uh, condition that can occur with highly exothermic reactors. We have extreme variability of manipulated flows for temperature and composition control. When you think of some crystallizations, and particularly biological reactions, uh, they go from zero to max. Uh, if you think of a fermenter or a bioreactor and you start out with the initial inoculum, uh, the, the requirement for uh, airflow uh, for dissolved oxygen control is extremely small because there aren't many cells. But then you get into the exponential growth phase and uh, you're into orders of magnitude larger requirements in terms of oxygen um, and therefore um, maybe airflow and, and maybe you're trying to do some other things in fermentation like increase the agitation speed and uh, pressure just to increase the transfer uh, to get the necessary uh, oxygen available to the cells. Uh, anyway, there's an incredible rangeability uh, as you go from the start to the finish of a batch. It's nonlinear. Uh, the responses to the changing volumes and concentrations so not only you don't have a steady state, but uh, the process gains and the process dynamics are changing with batch time. Uh, you have a unidirectional response in some cases uh, where the response uh, uh, only goes in one direction. Like for heating, the uh, temperature only goes up. Or if you're creating product, hopefully the product concentration only goes up. We have set point overshoot that becomes particularly problematic. Uh, and that's again maybe related to the fact that there is uh, no discharge flow, uh, no bottoms discharge flow, and we don't have a conventional steady state. And uh, some of these uh, reactions, particularly uh, biological ones, are very sensitive to this overshoot. And we're trying to get for set point changes uh, that occur uh, uh, that are optimum for growth or for product formation. Uh, we're trying to make sure that the overshoot for those set point changes is less than a tenth of a degree uh, centigrade or less than a tenth of a pH. There's a window of allowable PID gains, and this is uh, particularly problematic because people are not thinking that too low of a, a PID gain can be a problem. They've kind of learned uh, from um, what is kind of in, in, intuitive and uh, relationship and also from what was taught in process control courses that, uh, yeah, a high PID gain is going to cause oscillations and instability. But what we didn't know is too low of a PID gain can cause that. And actually the situation uh, can be worse in that the oscillations are slower and can become um, much larger. Uh, unless you're talking about a high PID gain that actually causes oscillations to grow in amplitude, of course, that's uh, severe instability. But if we're just talking about excessive oscillation, uh, oscillations that are still decaying, uh, they're actually uh, it's a, a more of a problem uh, for the slow PID gain because the amplitude is larger and the period is larger.
Uh, we have contaminants, impurities, and inhibitors that are trapped in a batch. Uh, whereas in continuous operation, uh, these are flowing out, and like I say, we say in the bottom flow. But here, since there's no bottom flow, they're trapped in the batch, and you, uh, you're, you're going to have it in your final uh, batch uh, composite, uh, composition. And so they can build up uh, if they're coming in from the feed. So it's very important that the feed be analyzed, the raw materials, to make sure that these uh, contaminants and impurities and inhibitors are eliminated uh, before the feed actually goes to the batch. So analysis of raw materials uh, becomes uh, very important for batch operations. We have uh, outline and offline analysis results, but often they're too late for a batch. It's after a phase is completed by the time we get the results, uh, particularly if it's uh, being done offline in a lab. And we have variability captured in the batch endpoint. There is no inherent attenuation. If you have a continuous operation, you have a continuous flow, it's going to another volume, and that volume is acting on, like a filter and attenuating oscillations. But here, uh, you know, it's discontinuous. Uh, there's no flow out of the batch until the end of the batch, and then it's a very high flow to empty that batch, get it ready for the next batch. And the batch process, uh, yield, uh, productivity, uh, quality, and repeatability are interrelated. And if you want to key on one thing, it would, it would, it would be repeatability because this is going to lead uh, to uh, effects on yield uh, and uh, quality and productivity. Uh, data exclusion is, is frequently a problem, and this goes back to, again, that uh, each phase being like a separate process, different equipment, different measurements, different valves that are involved. Well, let's look at the principal component analysis as being a major tool for batch analysis. Uh, but we have to be careful. Uh, we got to make sure there is exclusion of measurements of valves that are off, uh, that are in uh, inactive phases. Uh, so, you know, for that current phase, we have to make sure we're only uh, including uh, those measurements and valves that are participating in that particular phase. Uh, we have to make sure that the data compression is, uh, is not going to screen out some of the changes, which we, we don't know what's really significant in the beginning. Uh, so we have to be very careful that we are not uh, screening out small changes that we might think are insignificant, but do turn out to be in terms of affecting the batch. Use of manipulated flows as inputs. Uh, since uh, PID transfers variability uh, from the process variable to the manipulated variable, if the PID is doing a great job, actually you're going to see uh, the variability in the PID output. I mean, this is kind of natural if you ever looked at, uh, at trend charts. And if, <laughs> if your process variable is drawing a straight line at set point, uh, what you can see in terms of effects happening uh, that are being uh, taken care of by the PID, uh, you're going to see it in how it is changing its uh, output to, to keep that process variable drawing a straight line at that point. Translations to rate of change, uh, batch profile slopes. Uh, so here, you know, since we're continuously moving, uh, sometimes it's a temperature, but um, um, most likely it's always a concentration. We're always trying to increase a, a product concentration. What we really are interested in is, is how that is changing with batch time. And so we look at the slope of the batch profile of uh, key process variables, such as temperature and concentration. We have to be concerned that we have enough, but not too many batches. We've we got to have enough batches to make sure we see variability. But if we have too many batches, the model may try and co concentrate on a bunch of batches that don't show uh, much of the changes that are really important. So there's a kind of an optimum set of uh, batches, say uh, greater than 30, uh, but maybe less than 50. And this is kind of similar to what we run into in terms of uh, developing a, a neural network model. 
Uh, and also we need to keep a test set of batches off to the side uh, to validate that model, kind of like, again, what we do with a neural network model. We have models for each product grade and formulation, but that's kind of neat the fact that we have this uh, distinct uh, uh, difference now as we say, oh, this batch is a different product and a different formulation. We now use a different model. Uh, so we can very easily uh, uh, substitute different models depending on the different products and formulations uh, that are being made. We can get carried away with a number of principal components, and this is where we're trying to reduce, uh, you know, the huge number of measurements down to ones that are uh, independent of each other. Uh, we, we call them uh, orthogonal components, and uh, it, we can get carried away uh, in trying to get the very best possible model, particularly uh, you see this in, in, in the academic literature, perhaps, where they try and put in a a large number of principal components because they're just looking at the, the, the quality of the model, not realizing that it's not very usable if the number of principal components uh, becomes greater than five. So we're seeking to sacrifice maybe a little bit of model capability by being practical about this and saying we, we really, on an industrial situation, uh, have to be limiting our principal components uh, to be less than five. Uh, we have some statistics that are complementary. Uh, the hoteling T-squared statistic, uh, which gives an indication of uh, the match between uh, the subject batch uh, correlation and uh, the uh, model uh, correlation. And the model is not necessarily the best batch because uh, we, we don't know exactly what that is, uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a representative batch uh, is the model. And, and so we're looking here at the uh, quality of the match between the correlations of the subject batch uh, to, to the model batch. But then uh, we also want to know the QSPE statistic, which uh, tells us uh, what is the error, say, between a, a measurement in the subject batch and um, a measurement in the model batch, uh, particularly as, uh, associated at the same time and point in the batch as the hoteling T-squared uh, statistics. So these are complementary, and then if a problem doesn't show up in one, it'll probably then show up in the other. And so they're both very useful. A key capability is, uh, is, is the drill down to contributions when the control limit is exceeded. In other words, we want to know what measurements are correlated with the problem we're seeing at a particular time in the batch. And, th and this is, is so powerful because, uh, you know, one of the main reasons we go to dead analytics, we have so many measurements, we, we don't know what's affecting what. Here, we're, we have the ability to drill down and find uh, what measurements uh, or what PID outputs, uh, which may translate to a, hopefully, to a measured flow, um, are a major con contribution uh, to uh, the uh, violation or near violation of a control limit. And, of course, we need to make sure we uh, do an exclusion of outliers that are extraneous, that for some reason um, could be due to a measurement failure, some very strange condition that's not uh, normal, uh, that is uh, and not representative, and, and take those uh, outliers, those uh, measurements, uh, out of the analysis. And we need to ultimately verify these measurement correlations as being actual cause and effect relationships. And this requires a process involvement and process understanding. Some of the examples I remember from way back when is that, hey, you have a rooster crowing 
at the uh, at the break of dawn, and then you have the sunrise. And uh, if you don't really understand cause and effect, you may say, "Oh, uh, just uh, looking through the mathematical correlations, that oh, the rooster crowing uh, caused the sunrise," or an even more problematic situation that actually did occur. Uh, some data analytics was used to try and identify uh, enemy tanks. Uh, and I think this was decades ago. And uh, unfortunately, they always tried to do the identification at nighttime. And uh, what they ended up was a model that uh, had a correlation that uh, it was really that nighttime meant you had enemy tanks rather than the actual geometry uh, of, uh, say, the enemy tanks being uh, significant. And, and so th th that's why we, we need to really get the process people with an understanding involved. Uh, because we, the PCA, principal component analysis, uh, gives you correlations, but it re it's really up to you to verify the fact that they are uh, cause and effect uh, relationships and that they are not things that are either coincident with some of the inputs uh, or coincident with some of the outputs uh, that you're uh, uh, interested in in terms of uh, the principal component analysis and, and some predictions that we're going to see we can, we're going to try and get into. Uh, uh, extending principal component analysis to uh, uh, partial least squares and projection to latent structures, all with the same acronym of PLO. So here we are. I guess a more conventional definition is partial least squares, although I have seen it also called to be projection to latent structures, both having the same acronym of PLS. Um, there's good news in that uh, we do not need dynamic compensation like we do in continuous processes for synchronizing and, uh, and correcting uh, the predictions we get from the model with the actual analysis results, uh, whether they're uh, online, at line, or offline. Uh, because we're looking at batch endpoints, we just need um, or, or maybe it's a mid-batch point, but particularly batch endpoints, we're just looking uh, at a particular point in, in that batch and, and, and correlating that, that with an uh, analysis result. So um, you don't need uh, to worry about dynamic compensation and inserting dead times in, in the prediction uh, for, uh, for, for, say, the batch endpoint. The other thing we can do is uh, we can develop a worm plot where you have a plot of, of say here uh, shown two principal components, and uh, the cir it shows that a circle here it could be ellipse, but uh, inside the circle is a good batch, and particularly the inner batch of uh, circle is a, a good batch. And uh, as you uh, as you go to the outer circle, you're starting to get into possibly a bad batch, and if you go outside the outer circle, gosh. Uh, something very strange has happened, and you may have an outlier way off here in the upper left corner of this chart, and you know that that's just not, that batch endpoint just was strange and, and not representative. And so what we're actually plotting, say, is batch endpoints, and what you would like is, uh, uh, is the most recent batch endpoint, uh, which is what we call the head of the worm, uh, to be near the center. In fact, we would like this to be coiling into the center, showing uh, that the batchers are getting better and getting close to uh, the desirable score here at, at the intersection of these two principal components, uh, zero. We would like it, uh, you know, to coil in, but uh, it may in fact not be coiling in, and in this situation it is uncoiling and coming out and you can see the head of the worm here as being batch N uh, is, is headed uh, to where uh, it's going to perhaps on the next batch uh, go outside the inner circle. Uh, so you can tell uh, what's happening uh, in, in terms of where these batches are headed and maybe head off a problem uh, before it occurs.
Well, what we want to do is elevate the operator role through these uh, advances we have both in technology for automation, both in, in terms of what we've already discussed and, and what we will discuss. So we're trying to elevate the operator role from manual actions to supervision that involves repeatability, uh, quality, efficiency, and capacity. I think the operator appreciates this, that he can uh, do ultimately something that provides a much bigger contribution rather than routine stuff fighting and dealing with uh, actions that uh, are very, uh, that need to be repetitive, but you know, an operator just can't uh, be as repetitive um, just due to human nature and human response time and perception as, uh, say, an automation system. So automation intelligence and the repeatability you get from that enables continuous improvement. In other words, you can take uh, the best operator actions, uh, evaluate them, put them in, and, and then by it being repeatable, you can say, oh, you know, now I see what's happening. Uh, it's not like it's so scattered around doing different uh, operators doing different things, different ways, but um, I see this pattern and now I know, hey, I can make an improvement in that pattern. Uh, so it, it really, repeatability leads to a, an analysis uh, that will provide continuous improvement. We can have smart alarm logic to only activate the root cause lawn. Now, uh, this seems maybe too idyllic, but uh, we, we want to have that as our goal. And, and I know of one company that decades ago established this uh, uh, as uh, their goal and, and did a pretty good job of uh, achieving it. We want to have minimization of wait and phase times and operator attention requests. Uh, we, we just want things to move along and, and have the intelligence built in through either uh, statistical analysis or through analyzers and uh, automation of uh, sequences. And as we see through maybe uh, enhanced PIDs, to go ahead and move through without having to wait for an evaluation by an operator. So we have smart PID features and sequences to eliminate manual actions. We have principal component analysis to uh, automatically proceed if within control limits. We have projection of latent structures or partially squares to automatically proceed if predictions are good. We have phase hold times minimized uh, by lab and first principle models and tests. In other words, we can develop a model and predict what that uh, composition analysis can be and then uh, proceed and then you know, we can look later, well, did we need to improve that uh, prediction for the next batch? But meanwhile, we have uh, gone ahead and, uh, and proceeded with this batch. And uh, as we have uh, developed and corrected this model over time, we, we can develop the confidence uh, to actually proceed. You may at first just use this to monitor and see how well it, it does the prediction. And then uh, after you know, several batches of predictions and looking at a diminishing correction, perhaps, or a, a proper correction based on uh, some known situations, uh, that the model is doing a good enough job where you can just proceed. We have smart digital uh, controller read back to confirm uh, the actual valve positions uh, going on. You know, limit switches have been kind of problematic for batch operations in terms of the reliability and the fact that they, uh, you know, they, they are not necessarily that accurate. For me, middle signal selection of pH electrodes is very important, uh, particularly since pH electrodes um, can be susceptible to uh, situations that has extreme capability in terms of rangeability and sensitivity, but what comes along with that is uh, 
uh, some sensitivity uh, uh, to situations and uh, and the possibility of, of uh, some very confusing uh, noise and failures and errors. So the middle signal selection uh, inherently ignores any sort of failure or noise or error of any type, inherently. And what's interesting is people will put two electrodes on, knowing there is this uh, concern and importance of pH, but they don't think of going to the third. And that batch may be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars, or maybe in terms of biological reaction, millions of dollars. And here, the kind of quibbling over the expense of a, a third electrode. Smart transmitters improve accuracy and reliability and give diagnostics. This is a no-brainer. I mean, smart transmitters are uh, incredibly important everywhere, but here again, batch operations. Sensors with the least drift and best threshold sensitivity. In other words, we should be using RTDs if they are in the proper temperature uh, range. <clears throat> Rather than thermocouples, we're, we're talking about an order of magnitude less drift and an order of magnitude better sensitivity uh, that you get with an RTD. And operations that are made simpler through simultaneous instead of sequential operations and, and just through automation. Intelligent detection of endpoints. Here we look at an application of the enhanced PID, which has turned out to be so important uh, for the optimization of batch processes in so many ways. The enhanced PID was originally developed for wireless applications. Uh, but here we're looking at what its advantages are in terms of uh, the discontinuous signals uh, you would get from analyzers, whether they're at line or even offline analyzers. Because you can imagine that there can be uh, quite a, a delay between uh, when the sample is taken to you getting a result. And particularly for offline analyzers, it, it can be even uh, quite unpredictable besides being quite long. So here uh, we're going to look at uh, uh, how we use that enhanced PID, originally developed for wireless, uh, to help us uh, to optimize an ethanol plant, specifically the front end of an ethanol plant, uh, which involves uh, taking, the, in this case, the corn and uh, creating a, uh, a, a slurry which uh, will then go to a, a, a simultaneous uh, sacrification and fermentation uh, batch operation. But this uh, front end right here, this part of it is actually continuous. And uh, what we have is a corn analyzer saying, hey, what is the amount of fermentable uh, starch uh, that's uh, in that corn? And that's up at the corn feeder at the, in the top left. And uh, we even have a correction coming back uh, based on what the batches are doing in terms of average uh, fermentation time. One of the things you can realize that it's kind of interesting for uh, the, the batch of fermentation, it's actually simultaneous sacrification and fermentation. Um, but you get into a point due to inhibition from uh, the ethanol formation that even though you keep the batch longer, you're not going to really get any more ethanol uh, being produced. And uh, if also you're finding that it takes longer to get to your uh, ethanol endpoint, it means that uh, the, the amount of fermentable starch there is uh, less than what you would uh, want. So the, the time it takes to get to uh, the endpoint, and we're not saying that when that batch is decided to be done, because that's another decision, but how long does it take uh, based on analysis, and often there is an analysis on the fermenter um, in, in terms of actual ethanol concentration, uh, how long it takes to get to that ethanol endpoint can be used as a correction for this analyzer uh, as to what is the predicted fermentable starch. Well, the predicted fermentable starch uh, then is used uh, in a very simple calculation with the feeder speed to come up with what is a production rate for the front end. And this has value just in terms of uh, the operator capability to say, 
to see and say what the production rate should be for the front end. Um, so it is a, an ethanol production rate for the front end. That's a pretty simple uh, controller up there on the top left-hand side, AC1-4. And it's just going to manipulate the feeder speed. So if it comes back and sees, hey, I've got more fermentable starch, it'll immediately cut back on the speed of the feeder, immediately reducing uh, the amount of corn that's needed. And of course, corn is the biggest cost for ethanol production. Uh, the signal then is also can be used uh, to optimize the slurry solids. Uh, and that DC 2-4 controller is way off on the right side. And uh, typically we use a Coriolisus meter to get a very accurate density measurement to give us an inferential measurement of slurry solids. And we're optimizing that set point. Uh, based on what we uh, get as information coming out of this uh, corn analyzer. And we're even using a feed forward based on desired changes in production rate uh, to give a, 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 a um, preemptive action in terms of helping uh, the slurry solids concentration controller uh, deal with desired production rate changes. And so um, oh, we, we have uh, a manipulation then uh, for a slurry solids concentration uh, and going on and say in, in terms of uh, the dilution water going to slurry uh, tank number one. Um, so uh, we uh, use the enhanced uh, PID um, both for uh, the front end production rate and also the slurry solids and uh, concentration control and uh, and even for a fermentation time enhanced uh, PID, making this correction uh, to the uh, analyzer signal we're getting for uh, the corn. One of the simple ways of optimizing a process is simply adding another PID controller uh, that's called a valve position control, a VPC. And uh, you can very simply do this by a configuration change. And uh, it's uh, using existing signals. Uh, principally, it's looking at a valve position of, of something that could be limiting um, how much feed uh, you can send to, say, a fed batch reactor. Um, and uh, it's looking at uh, what that uh, valve position is on uh, that may be limiting how much you, faster you can run that batch. Uh, and also with a set point to saying, hey, this is the, this is the, uh, uh, the closest we can get to uh, uh, an output limit in terms of uh, a valve position that's becoming a limitation. So there's a set point for the valve position controller that is uh, set far enough away from uh, the output limit for that valve to make sure it's always got throttling capability. Uh, so, uh, feed rate for fed batch reactors are maximized by the valve position control pushing the following valves to their maximum effective valve throttling position. And uh, examples of jacket coolant, uh, condenser coolant, and vent valve. And often as we try and get more and more out of unit operations and batches, the original utility systems were really not designed to handle this. The external reset feedback, that is an option uh, with the PID, uh, with a slowed down and fast upset point rate limits on reactor feed flow controller. In other words, this VPC is output is going to a uh, reactor feed flow control set point uh, provides a directional move suppression. Uh, we have move suppression in uh, model predictive control, but here, hey, we can do it in PID control, and furthermore, we can make it directional, enabling a uh, gradual smooth optimization and a fast correction for abnormal changes without having to worry about how that affects the, the tuning of the controller. Uh, in other words, so we can tune uh, for, say, the fast correction for abnormal uh, conditions. And through this uh, uh, rate limit, set point rate limits on the reactor feed flow controller and the external reset, 
feedback of the valve position controller, well, we can achieve this directional move suppression and uh, make sure uh, we don't try and move too fast uh, when we're doing an optimization. Optimizations are almost inherently uh, meant to be done slowly so that they are not disruptive. So the enhanced PID developed for wireless with a threshold sensitivity settings can also ignore the limit cycles in these valve positions that is trying to push to their uh, maximum effective uh, throttling position. And so, you know, there are always a little, even good valves, very tiny limit cycles. And uh, the enhanced PID can ignore that because uh, through its external reset feedback function, and uh, the fact that it's not going to uh, actually make a correction um, uh, and ignore these limit cycles, it, uh, it is advantageous. Uh, we can have coordinated ratio control of feed batch reactants uh, by the use of a filtered set point. And, and this minimizes the upsets, the stoichiometry. We want, as we change uh, feed rates uh, or the ratio of those feed rates, we want the, the, those changes to move in balance according to what we think is the stoichiometry. So uh, one is not trying to uh, catch up with another and cause a temporary unbalance. So here we have an example for a bed-fed batch reactor. And if we look at the top uh, uh, right side there, we have a valve position controller, ZC1-5. And uh, it is uh, looking at the, the vent uh, valve position. And it turns out that this uh, reactor has a, a gas product uh, going out through the vent and also a liquid product that, when the batch is done, uh, would, would uh, be emptied uh, uh, from the bottom of the reactor. But anyway, the ZC1-5 up in the top right uh, is um, uh, looking at seeing what can I do uh, to maximize that vent valve position, which is the off gas product, and, 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 and uh, do that by increasing the feed rate uh, of uh, reactant A, which is at the uh, top uh, left side. Um, if we look uh, on the top uh, right side and go down one to ZC1-10, we're seeing that it is trying to uh, maximize the maximum throttle position of the uh, condenser valve uh, being manipulated by uh, TC1-10. And if we go down further on down the right side, we see a ZC1-4, and we uh, know that it is maximizing uh, the position of the uh, makeup uh, cooling tower water that is uh, going to the jacket of the fed batch reactor. And all of these uh, valve position controllers, these ZCs, uh, go to a low signal selector, uh, which is over here on the left side um, uh, towards the bottom. And uh, what we come out of that low signal selector is uh, the cascade set point uh, for um, FC1-1, which is uh, the reagent A flow controller. Now, an important note here is that we have set point filters used to coordinate this. And we make sure that the set point filter is set uh, large enough so that the slower loop uh, can keep up with it. And uh, so we have a set point filter on uh, reagent A, FC1-1, and also on uh, reagent or reactant B, uh, FC1-2. And uh, these filters uh, are then identical and hopefully uh, then uh, cause these two flows to move in unison uh, to prevent any upset uh, to unbalance in the uh, stoichiometry. Uh, even though it's on a short-term basis, any upset, uh, these can build up over time, these upsets, uh, and be accumulated and show up as a non-repeatable batch. And this particular strategy was actually able to increase uh, the capacity of batches by uh, more than 25% uh, uh, in terms of eliminating uh, 
batch interruptions uh, and, and also maximizing uh, feed rate uh, during the batch. And so uh, they, on a sold out product, a 25% increase in uh, capacity is really appreciated. So here we're going to look at uh, batch profile slope opportunities. As I mentioned before, batch temperatures often are changing, um, often they're going up. Uh, and uh, the concentrations, uh, particularly the product concentration, hopefully is going up uh, with batch time. So the essential methods used to compute the batch profile slope uh, for continuous measure, measurements, uh, such as anline analyzers, we pass the process variable or, or the manipulated variable through a dead time block. This dead time block, I can't emphasize how key this is uh, in, in terms of uh, creating a signal that has um, a good signal to noise ratio and provides continuous updates. Uh, as fast as you get uh, uh, an analysis. And with online out analyzers, again, essentially a continuous measurement, you're getting updates rather quickly. Um, but uh, this can translate to a problem if you do another type of calculation of the rate of change uh, through some sort of calculation block. Here you simply want to use a dead time block. And the output of the block, the old value is subtracted from the input of the block, the new value, and divided by the dead time. The resulting rate of change is multiplied by the time interval and added to a new value to get a future value. Uh, dead time and time interval are chosen large enough to provide good signal noise ratio. And this dead time block is, is the key to continuous and fast updates of the slope. For discontinuous measurements, that line and offline analyzers, you compute the slope when the measurement is updated. You get analysis results, and, and that's kind of obvious. The batch profile slope enables endpoint production, um, uh, and it can be as simple as a, a, a sudden change in a key process variable and. And this is a case for some conductivity measurements uh, where, say, a chlorination was involved. Um, or a manipulated variable where, hey, the vent, vent flow suddenly goes uh, very low, uh, indicating the end of uh, a reaction. Or it could be a, a vectored approach of the process variable, you know, based on the slope and predicting a future value. Uh, say the, the, a concentration, or uh, a uh, another calculation based on manipulated variables uh, that is uh, related to cooling. For example, if it's an exothermic reaction, and uh, there, it, and you see that there is going to be predicted uh, a a drop in the cooling, it means uh, basically the reaction is pretty much done. Uh, the batch profile slope enables a decision, the trade-off between uh, reducing uh, cycle time, which if you don't have any limitations downstream, uh, bottlenecks downstream, it can translate to increased capacity by uh, increasing the number of batches. Um, and uh, there's a trade-off, though, uh, in, in this decision of increasing yield. In other words, if you keep it a little bit longer, you, you may get a little bit more product out of uh, the raw materials that you charge, but is is that really worth it? Is capacity uh, more important than, uh, and you can do dollar values here of what is the value of additional capacity versus the dollar value of the incremental yield uh, by waiting longer based on the batch profile uh, slope saying uh, this is where the future value is going to be of uh, particularly, you know, you're looking at a concentration or the uh, end of a reaction. Um, and the batch profile slope uh, can be used by model predictive control. Uh, and now uh, we have a, a process variable such as product concentration uh, uh, that itself would only be hopefully going up. 
But if you're looking at the slope of uh, the change in product concentration, that slope can decrease as well as increase. And so we now have a process variable response that is bidirectional, and that's what we need uh, for model predictive control. Um, we, we, we really couldn't use literally the concentration itself. First of all, it's a, you'd have a changing set point, but the thing is you couldn't really say, oh, well, uh, I've overshot set point, I need to decrease the process concentration. Uh, that's not really a legitimate strategy, but what you can do is use the slope and say, this is, uh, hey, this is uh, the rate of change of concentration that I'm looking for at this point in the match. Well, here's an example of optimization by model predictive control for a bioreactor. And uh, here we're looking at uh, the slope of the cell concentration, which is cell growth rate, and uh, the slope of uh, the product concentration, uh, which is product formation rate. And these uh, two uh, slope calculations come into a model predictive controller shown uh, towards the bottom right side. And its uh, output is manipulating uh, two set points. One of it is uh, the glutamine concentration. It's an amino acid concentration and also a uh, glucose concentration. And so it comes up with the optimum amount of that needed uh, to achieve these uh, objectives of, uh, of a particular product a formation rate or a particular cell growth rate. In the beginning of the batch, uh, the cell growth rate may be more important. And uh, towards the end of the batch, of course, the product formation rate uh, becomes most important. I mentioned in the very beginning that one of the difficulties with batch processes is that there is no steady state like we have in continuous operations. Uh, what we have is a non-self-regulating response. Uh, and we focus on that being an integrating response. It could be runaway, but even if it is a runaway, you, you can't uh, get into the acceleration. you, you got to take action before you get into acceleration. So you actually treat those as integrating processes as well, but uh, making sure you're aggressive enough where you react to the initial slope, uh, rate of change of the process variable, and uh, don't get into um, waiting so long that you, it starts to accelerate, and particularly an exothermic, uh, highly exothermic reactor, you, you don't get into the point where the temperature um, increase uh, starts to accelerate on you, uh, indicating a runaway condition. So we, we, we can say, hey, for concentration and temperature, uh, we, uh, and also for pressure, uh, vessel pressure, or uh, column pressure, we're going to focus on integrating process tuning rules. And uh, this is very important, not only in terms of getting the right settings uh, to begin with, but preventing you from getting in trouble with this very strange situation you're probably not used to in terms of uh, the allowable window of PID gains where uh, too low of a PID gain is going to cause some very severe oscillations. And in the case of a runaway, a very dangerous uh, situation where uh, explosive situation uh, where the reaction can run away from you. So you want to get uh, into realizing that you, you need to use integrating uh, process tuning rules. And the first thing you need to do is to set the reset time. And the control objective here for lambda tuning is an arrest time. And, you know, we don't have a time constant here. And uh, we don't uh, have a steady state. So we're not talking about a closed loop time constant, which is maybe what you're more used to in terms of a lambda for lambda tuning or uh, a... Uh, uh, gamma for internal model control. Here we're, we're looking at an arrest time. How long does it take uh, a, for a disturbance to for it to be reversed in direction, to, to or actually to stop the move, at least stop the movement uh, uh, that is going uh, with in in terms of a disturbance and and start the 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 recovery. And this uh, arrest time uh, should be 
set in terms of dead time. Very, very key. Uh, so the minimum rest time can be thought of as the dead time. And so if we look at the reset time here and we go uh, with a lambda rest time, uh, that's the dead time, we would end up uh, with three dead times as uh, the reset time. But we, we can't get that close uh, to the very minimum uh, arrest time. And so what we normally use is a lambda that is two dead times or three dead times. But the important thing is we do this reset calculation first. Uh, re and it's reset time. It's seconds. Make sure you get the units right. This is not repeats per second. Uh, this is not repeats per minute. This is seconds. What's, uh, what it turns out to be is seconds per repeat, but they dropped that last part off, and so we just talk about seconds. And so we, we first um, choose a lambda and give us a reset time. And again, lambda uh, typically would be maybe two dead times, three dead times. If you have some uncertainty as to how accurately you know the dead time, uh, or you want to deal with more nonlinearities, which can happen over the batch, you set uh, that lambda as a greater number of dead times, maybe four or five or even six dead times. But uh, once you choose that, uh, and of course for uh, highly exothermic uh, uh, reactors, you have to be careful and to try and not use a, a lambda too large. You know, you want to get down to two dead times or three dead times, all possible. Uh, once you choose that reset time, you then go on to the controller gain calculation and use it in that. And you have to know the integrating process gain, which is not uh, too difficult in that it's you know, based on the initial ramp rate. Just got to get the units right. And this is very key to controller tuning. So you take the initial ramp rate, say, in terms of percent per second, and you divide that by the change in controller output in terms of percent you made. And, and those percent units cancel out and you end up with a, a, an integrating process gain and, and more properly called an open loop integrating process gain uh, that has units of one over second. By setting the reset time first and then the controller gain per the above tuning rules, you prevent the violation of the low gain limit. And uh, and a rest time greater than the dead time uh, prevents a violation of the high gain limit. So uh, what is this low gain limit? Well, we didn't talk about it, but really what we would like to prevent the start of slow rolling oscillations, and that occurs if we have uh, the controller gain here, as shown in this bottom expression, greater than uh, twice uh, the inverse of the product of the integrating process gain and uh, or integral time, reset time. I, I can't emphasize how big a problem this is. Because the controller gain that we would come up with is so large be, due to the very slow open loop integrating process gain, we, um, we, we end up getting into violation of low gain limit. And, and and the way we get out of that, if we can't even do this tune, the first thing we would go in is we would increase the reset time by uh, uh, a couple orders of magnitude. In some cases, even three orders of magnitude. And that, and, and that in the denominator there, that last uh, expression, uh, uh, enables us to get out of violation uh, of the uh, low control gain. Um, but the real solution is to up front, uh, at the very top of this page, is to set that reset time properly, uh, based on the dead time, then calculate the controller gain. Now, if you don't like that controller gain, uh, because you're ending up, you know, it being 50 or even 75 or, or, or larger, uh, well, first evaluate whether that's causing a problem, because you can put uh, as we mentioned before, uh, set point rate limits on whatever this is manipulating and uh, use external reset feedback and provide directional move suppression so that this very high gain does not uh, upset, say, uh, whoever might be affected by whatever you're manipulating. And say if it's a temperature controller, you're manipulating 
a utility uh, flow. Um, if you use that external reset feedback, giving a directional move suppression, you don't need to retune the controller. Uh, that's the big advantage of that. So you, you, you go by these tuning rules, and uh, hey, you've got this big, you know, um, big controller game, but as long as you're not uh, upsetting somebody else, uh, maybe you can just get the operator over the fact that it's moving around the output so much. We have actually had uh, reactors that are uh, exothermic. They do a lot better by the very rapid movement, even when, you know, the, the output is jockeying around so much uh, in terms of the tightness of the temperature control, which is uh, really needed for product quality and for safety. And finally, we get at the very end here, uh, we do want some derivative action, and, and that is compensating for the secondary lags. Uh, for temperature control, say it's compensating for uh, the heat transfer lags, heat transfer surface lags, and also for a thermal well lag. Very important uh, to have that derivative action in there. Uh, for particularly uh, for uh, temperature control, and uh, and in some cases, uh, if you have continuous uh, concentration measurement through uh, online analyzers for concentration control. Well, here, before we get to the summary, we have a little bit more comic relief. So here are the top 10 apps as anniversary gifts to help an automation engineer. How about an app that translates common speech to engineer talk? Or translates engineer talk to common speech? Explains automation without causing glazed eyes? Provides uh, attendance uh, and suggestions for grooming. And uh, show how to wear clothing from the century. Learn to be as funny as the Big Bang characters. Learn to chill out. Enjoy mindless fun. Forget about logic sometimes. And anticipate and understand the needs of the spouse. Well, let's conclude uh, with a list of best practices. Um, some of these things I haven't mentioned, but are kind of obvious. Uh, Coriolis meters on liquid feeds for precise concentration control uh, through the incredibly accurate uh, density measurement besides the mass flow measurement and extremely uh, accurate uh, component totalization as a result. Analysis of raw materials for trace components particularly inhibitors that could affect conversion time or product quality, and to take compensatory actions uh, before they end up in the batch. As many unit operations made simultaneous as possible, such as filling, heating, and pressurization to reduce batch cycle time. Automation of all manual actions by smart PID control and sequences. Elimination of wait and hold time by proceeding without Manual, operator, or lab data entry or approval by inferential measurements and uh, data analytics. Inferential measurements are particularly in terms of uh, uh, providing uh, either first principle or neural network or um, PL by PLS uh, or maybe even a combination of all those, a, a concentration. Smart instruments uh, with the best repeatability, reliability, and least and least drift sensors. Uh, online metrics of batch efficiency and capacity, so that we can make these decisions based on uh, future uh, process variables in terms of uh, predicted uh, compositions and temperatures in the batch as to uh, what we should be doing with that batch. Data analytics to monitor batch repeatability and predict uh, endpoints. Integrating process tuning rules with uh, rest time set relative to dead time for primary batch composition, pH, pressure, and temperature uh, PID controllers. And for a unit uh, unidirectional single-ended uh, response where the process variable only goes in one direction, as I mentioned, say, if you're only heating up batch, uh, or you're talking about product concentration, um, 
Or even pH, where you only have, uh, say, one reagent. You don't have a split range of, say, acid and bases, but you only have a base reagent and you're raising pH. That's only going to go in one direction. If you're talking about PID control, uh, what you need to do is uh, go to a proportional plus derivative control structure, one that does not have interval action. And uh, the other opportunity is, as we mentioned, to convert that process variable to be the slope uh, of, the, of the batch profile. Well, here we continue with the last list of uh, best practices. And um, we want to do control the batch profile slope, where the slope can decrease as well as increase by directional response, uh, by the use of rate of change uh, of uh, key batch process variables uh, as a control variable. And, and this eliminates uh, overshoot. Uh, and a rate of change computation of a process variable or manipulated variable of indicators and controllers respectively uh, uh, and, and to predict product uh, and, and, uh, and to detect uh, the end of batch phases and make economic decisions, say efficiency versus capacity, uh, is, is very useful. And it's a very simple calculation to be made. Uh, the key is for continuous measurements is to use a dead time block to get the right signal noise ratio. Inferential measurements conversion such as cooling rate and total for chemical reactors and crystallizers, oxygen uptake rate and total for bioreactors, and carbon dioxide production rate and total for fermenters can be very uh, useful uh, as indications of uh, conversion. Uh, for rate of change computation and future value of a process or manipulated variable, the dead time block used uh, uh, is incredibly important to improve signal uh, to noise ratio and the immediacy of, of values you get. Uh, feeds optimized based on uh, raw material and batch composition analysis that's, that's very important for getting uh, the most out of what you got. Uh, an enhanced PID used for batch composition control with outline or offline analyzers for stopping limit cycles from dead band resolution limits of uh, those valves it's looking at, say, for valve position control. And uh, I didn't mention this, but uh, that directional move suppression is also used to um, to deal with the split range uh, discontinuities. In other words, uh, you would have a, a slower rate of change in terms of when you approach uh, a split range point because often there are unnecessary crossings of the split range point due to temporary situations. And the, any sort of crossing of the split range point is problematic in terms of being a severe dust continuity and creating oscillations. And so you don't want to cross the split range point if you don't have to. If you use this directional move suppression where uh, uh, the, the PID controller understands what's going on and it realizes, hey, when you're moving towards the split range point, it's uh, going to uh, have a, a slower transition to that point. And you don't need to retune it. Uh, to deal with this, again, through the external reset feedback, it's going to take care of everything uh, for you. And then we're, we've seen how valve position control can be used to optimize uh, fed batch operations. And model predictive control can also be used using the slopes, uh, say, of key concentrations. An example we gave was for the bioreactor cell concentration and product concentration, and really slopes being cell growth rate and product formation rate. And finally, uh, uh, and not really uh, discussed here, uh, is the fact that high fidelity uh, models and virtual plants can be used to understand uh, and develop opportunities and, of course, to prototype them and test them and, and um, improve them before you even make them in, in, into the batch. And this all can be done um, offline. On, and if you want to synchronize it, uh, it can be looking at uh, what's going on on batch. And you can even try it out 
where it's suggesting what it would do based on being synchronized with the batch, uh, but uh, you don't actually uh, use the uh, suggestions. Just monitor those suggestions and and evaluate uh, how valuable they would be. Well, here are some related uh, resources. There is an article, Life is a Batch, in Control Magazine, May 2005. And then also in Control Magazine, July 2008, Unlocking the Secret Profiles of Batch Reactors. And then again in Control, uh, 2012, Getting the Most Out of Your Batch. Uh, most recently, I've uh, published uh, a book uh, through ISA, Advances in Reactor Measurement and Control. Uh, it's 2015, and also went to the fourth edition of my Good Tuning, a Pocket Guide, and uh, that uh, was published in 2015. And then there was this article in Intec Magazine, uh, How to Avoid uh, Common Tuning Mistakes, and that was in the uh, May-June 2015 issue of Intec. And thank you all for staying with this uh, presentation, and I uh, hope uh, it really makes a difference in uh, making you uh, more successful and uh, making uh, batches um, more productive and, and you getting the rec uh, recognition for that.